Hi, I'm Stephen Apt, and here at Divine Savior Church, we believe that the message of Jesus truly changes lives. And so it's my prayer that as you listen to this message, that it does change your heart, uh, that it brings you peace and hope once again today. After you listen to it, if you wouldn't mind subscribing and liking, uh, we'd be grateful for that so that more people can hear the message of Jesus. Thank you. We are in a series called New Year, New You, and what we've been doing is focusing on how as we start a new year, a lot of people turn the calendar and want to set goals and resolutions uh, to make a better version of themselves this year. And so we're doing a series focusing on how God has already made us new and then what that means for our lives in this new year. If you were with us last week, uh, you saw that we are salt and light, Jesus says. He says, you are the salt of of the world. You are the, or the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We preserve this world from decay and corruption. We are the light of the world as we let God's light, Jesus' light, shine out of our hearts into this world of darkness. Today, as we consider that we are salt and light from last week, uh, maybe some of us have a goal for our, this year that we want to walk closer to Jesus. We want to read the Bible more. We want to live light. We want to be salt in this world. And this is what we want to do. And we want our lives to reflect Jesus more this year in the way we talk, in the way we conduct ourselves, and in the way that we read Scripture. And so what's our motivation? How will you continue on? I read an article this week uh, about New Year's resolutions, and it said that of all the resolutions that are made, 19% actually are fulfilled. I tend to think that's high, but maybe that's just me. I'll trust psychology today. (laughs) But that means that 81% fail. Why? Why? Because goals and resolutions are generally made in a moment of optimism, in a moment of hope. They set goals for themselves, and then when difficulties happen, when things get hard, when there's pushback, it's so easy to just give up. And so where's the motivation coming from? So that when you experience pushback, when things get difficult, when your schedules get busy, what's our motivation to live for Jesus. We're going to look at John chapter 3 today uh, to talk about this. John is one of those books of the Bible, uh, the four books that we call the Gospels. Uh, They're the biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those four books deal with Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And in John, uh, we hear of Jesus meeting with a man named Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And what we're going to see is this conversation happens at night and Jesus challenges Nicodemus. Here's what we're told. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Who is Nicodemus? We learn several things about Nicodemus just from this section of Scripture. Number one, he's a Pharisee. Uh, A Pharisee was a Jewish religious leader uh, who was extremely moral. Uh, Not only did they outwardly follow God's laws, but then they also followed all the tradition of the elders. So you had God's law, and then you had all these traditions of how to be a good Jewish person in er, in the first century, and Nicodemus fulfilled them all outwardly speaking. 
uh, everyone looked to Nicodemus and, and the Pharisees and would say, I need to be more like him if I'm going to find God's grace. I need to be more like him if I want to enter the kingdom. I need to strive to work to become more like Nicodemus. This was his reputation in the community as one who followed God's law, who was close to God's law, and walked in the steps of God's law. We're told that he's part of the Jewish ruling council. And so what do we know about him automatically? He's old. Uh, Only old guys could be on the Jewish ruling council. And he was, the, the Jewish ruling council, had their hands in a couple things in regards to the Jewish people. Politically, they, they had their hand in the political world at the time, but also the religious world, to make sure the doctrine was being taught correctly and making sure that the church was on the up and up, that there was no controversies going on, and if there were, they immediately put it down. This is what the ruling council did. It also probably meant he was a wealthy man and a prominent man, because only the wealthy prominent got on the ruling council. What we didn't read, because it's later on in the chapter, is he's also a teacher of, the, of Israel. So he's a Pharisee. He not only lives it, he's a teacher of it, and he's part of that Jewish ruling council that people look to. And if people looked at Nicodemus, what did they see? They saw someone that had to be part of the kingdom of God, because look at his life. It's this man who comes to see Jesus, a religious insider, so to speak, who comes to see Jesus at night. Why at night? Uh, I was surprised. Uh, I always thought it was because he was curious. Um, And commentators are kind of split on this. Uh, Either he's curious or he's playing some politics here. As a member of the Jewish religious council, Jesus is starting to make some waves. He's starting to do all these miracles. He's starting to teach and to preach, and it's a little different than what the Pharisees are teaching and preaching. And so he comes at night to say, Jesus, we know you're a man of God. No one can do the signs that you are doing if he weren't from God. And if he was given the opportunity to continue speaking, it might have looked something like this. But Jesus, here's the deal. You need to play ball with us. We're, 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 we're okay with you coming in, we're okay with you preaching and teaching, but you're borderline blaspheming here. And so you need to get in line here, and, and we'll let it go, but you need to start playing ball with us. But Jesus doesn't give him the opportunity, does he? Instead, Jesus just cuts him off. I tell you the truth. Unless if you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus says, hey, Glad you're here. I don't want to talk about me. I want to talk about the kingdom of God and how you, Nicodemus, are not in it. And imagine the shock that Nicodemus had to have. Unless I'm born again, I'm not part of the kingdom of God. Everyone looked to this religious insider and and would have said, he's in. And Jesus says, you're out. Unless if you're born again. Again, when we think of a born again Christian, who's the type of pe- what are the type of people that you think of as born again Christians? Probably people who have wandered from the church, have made a mess of their life, and now are coming back and want to rededicate themselves, so to speak, to God and have a clean, fresh start. That's not how Jesus uses it. Jesus talks to the religious insider, the one who is morally upright, the church-going person, and he says, unless if you, Mr. Nicodemus, are reborn, you will not see the kingdom of God. Do you know what we learn from that? It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how good you are. Everybody needs to be reborn, and that's your first point this morning. There we go. Everyone needs to be reborn. Jesus says, Nicodemus, 
unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. In other words, currently, right now, Nicodemus, you are not in the kingdom. You are not seeing the kingdom. And you will not see the kingdom unless if you are born again. And that had to be to a great shock to Nicodemus. And it might be to a great shock to us. And yet this is what Scripture says time and time again. Psalm 51. Surely I was sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. From the very moment of conception, we are sinful. That's a hard concept to grasp because little baby in the womb hasn't done anything. Sin is more than just action. It's like a genetic disorder passed down from generation to generation. My parents passed it down to me. I passed it down to my little girls and they will eventually pass it down down to their children. And guess what's not part of God's kingdom? Sin. Sin. This is why Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. We are born, we have physical life, but spiritually speaking, we are dead. And we need to be made alive. And so Nicodemus, Mr. Nicodemus, you're not in. Why? Because you have been relying on your works, on your achievements, on your resume, on your standing in the community for your salvation, thinking that's what got you into the kingdom of God. But Mr. Nicodemus, none of that matters unless you are born again. And the same is true for you and me. It doesn't matter who you are here today. If we want to see the kingdom of God, we have to be born again. And yet it's so easy to be Mr. Nicodemus, isn't it? To, to look at society and feel pretty good about ourselves. Because at least I'm not like them. At least my life isn't a mess like them. I'm in church every Sunday, unlike my neighbors who never go to church. I give to church I support the ministry, unlike a lot of other people that I know who are spending it on themselves. I attend Bible studies. I attend small groups. I attend all these things. Of course I'm in the kingdom of God. Look at me. And Jesus looks and says, unless if you're born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. It's easy to be like Nicodemus and think that it's our our family line that gets us in. Nicodemus was an Israelite, God's chosen nation. Of course he was going to see the kingdom of God. And you are from a Christian family, had Christian parents, and they were Christian, and before them they were Christian. You, know, you admit you haven't been to church as often as you should, but it's okay, I'm from a Christian family. Jesus looks and says, unless if you are reborn, you will not see the kingdom of God. For those of you who have been away from the church and maybe have made kind of a mess for your life and you you want to come back, maybe you're sitting thinking, I have to clean myself up. I have to be a little more like Nicodemus before Jesus will accept me. And Jesus says, that's not how it works. Unless if you're reborn, you will not see the kingdom of God. And maybe you're not a Christian here today. And you're thinking, wow, I'm glad this doesn't apply to me. Understand there are two positions, and it, quite frankly, it doesn't really matter if you acknowledge it or not, because God says, here are the two positions. You're in the kingdom or you're out of the kingdom, and the only way to get into the kingdom is if you're reborn, is if you're born again. You're either in or you're out. Those are the two positions. And so maybe we're sitting like Nicodemus right now and we're asking, how can this be? (laughs) How can this be? 
Nicodemus is sitting there thinking, I can't, actually he says it out loud, I, I can't go back into my mother's womb to be born a second time. So how does this work? It's not through our achievements. It's not through our works. In fact, when you're born, who does all the work? Moms here, you know, moms do. (laughs) The person being born, the baby being born, does no work in the birthing process. It's all mom's labors, all mom's work that makes the birth happen, that brings the life. In the same way, when it comes to spiritual birth, it has nothing to do with your work. You are the recipient. We need someone outside of us to do the work to bring us into the kingdom. And now you're starting to see the desperation a little bit, aren't you? If that's true, how do I get in if I can't actively do anything to get in? And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Unless you, unless if you are born again of water and the Spirit, you will not enter the kingdom because flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. It is through baptism. It's your next point. It is through baptism. The waters of baptism that the Spirit gives me life. That's what Jesus is talking about, isn't he? born again of the water and the Spirit. In baptism, God gives us the new life that we need. Ephesians chapter 2, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. He made us alive even when we were dead in our sins. Titus chapter 3, He saved us. Not because of the righteous things we've done. Not because we were good little Nicodemuses. But because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. It is because the Holy Spirit labors and works to bring us new life, a new birth, through the waters of baptisms that we have been made alive. So that we can see the kingdom of God and we are a part of it. In just a little bit, we're going to have eight baptisms here this morning. And what is God going to do for each one of those children? He's going to make them spiritually alive through the waters of baptism as the Spirit gives them new life into the kingdom of God. And he's done that for you. For those of you who have been baptized, he has brought you a new life through the waters of baptism. He has brought you from death to life. And it's all by his grace. Do you see what this does for you and me? It either, one, crushes our pride. The pride that I have, that I stand on my achievements, I am good because look what I've done. God says, no, no, no. The only reason you're in is through my grace that you have been reborn. For those of you who uh, are feel like you have no reason to be in the kingdom and there's no hope, this brings you hope. Because it's not about your achievements. It's not about how bad or good you've been. It's all by the grace of God that he's given you birth into the kingdom of God and it's through the waters of baptism that he washes you. Through the water and the spirit and the spirit gives you the spirit of life. This is what God does for you and me. He gives us a new life. Now, are we promoting another way to salvation? I thought Jesus died on the cross, and it's through Christ's work on the cross and his resurrection that I've entered the kingdom of God, that I have salvation. Correct. So what are we talking about with the waters of baptism? Here's what Paul says in Romans chapter 6. Or don't you know, that all of us who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Your Savior Jesus, what did he do for you? He labored and worked 
on your behalf. He labored and worked, fighting every temptation for you. He labored and worked as he died on the cross to shed his blood for you. He labored and worked as he rose from the dead, conquering the grave. And Paul says that when you are baptized, you are baptized into his death and resurrection. When the waters of baptism wash over these children today, what's going to happen? God connects them to Jesus' death and resurrection. When you were baptized and the waters of baptism washed over you, you were connected to Christ's death and resurrection on your behalf. This is what gives the power behind the baptism. It connects you to Jesus' death and resurrection to give you the forgiveness of sins and life eternal that we so desperately need. And it's yours and it's theirs by God's grace. You're looking for empowerment. There's nothing more empowering than our baptism, and that's your last point. Baptism empowers us to live for Jesus. There is no way to enter the kingdom of God unless God gives you a spiritual rebirth. And we are told in the waters of baptism, he connects you to Jesus' death and resurrection. And it is through this that we are empowered. Every morning we wake up and we begin the day by confessing our sins before God. God, on my own, by nature, I cannot see your kingdom. But here's what you promised me in my baptism. You promised that my sins have been washed away. You promised me that I've I've been washed clean. You promised me that I have a the pledge of a clear conscience before you. You promise me in Galatians chapter 3 that I'm your child and that you wrapped me in Jesus' robes of righteousness. And it's all by your grace. I haven't earned it or deserved it, but you've given it to me. Lord, look what you have done for me. Now I want to go and spend time with you in your word because I want to I mine the depths of your grace. If this is what you've done for me, I want to know you better. I want to live for you, Lord, because look what you've done for me. You've given me a new life. And just like Christ has been raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, I get to live a new life, not one of sin, but one of praise and thanks for what you've done for me. Every day we wake up and we remember our baptism, that in the waters of baptism we are connected to the life and death of Jesus. And it's only because of that that we have been given this new life now and forever. And so let's praise and thank, serve, and obey our God in everything we do. Let's constantly come back to our baptism because it's there that we find the empowerment to live lives for Jesus. May God bless you as you do just that. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we praise and thank you for the love that you have for us, that you would send your one and only Son Uh, John chapter 3 is that famous chapter where we're told that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Uh, You sent your one and only son to win salvation for us, to labor and work to bring us this new life, to conquer sin and death. Uh, We thank you for the waters of baptism where the Holy Spirit, you tell us, gives us a new life as he connects us to our Savior Jesus and the work that he's done. We thank you for the spiritual rebirth so that we are in the kingdom. Uh, As we go about our days, as we go about our lives, let us constantly come back to our baptism where we remember what you've done for us, that you've washed away our sins, you've connected us to our Savior Jesus, both his life and his death and resurrection, so that we may live lives for you this year. We thank you for the new life that you've given us. Continue to let us live and walk uh, to your praise and glory. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you again for listening to this message today. It's my prayer that uh, it has changed your heart as you grew in the message of your Savior, Jesus. Again, if you wouldn't mind liking and subscribing, we'd be grateful for that. God bless your day.